الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد Sisters, elders, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's the wilada of the eighth Holy Imam, Imam Rada alayhi salam. But again, it's a day of mixed feelings. Uh, as much as we want to send our salams and mubarakis to the Imam of the time, to Imam Rada alayhi salam on this auspicious day, but we also have to send him condolences. Um, as you all must have heard about the death of the Iranian president and the foreign minister and all the others who were with him. Um, indeed, he was a great servant of Imam Rada alayhi uh, salam. Before he became the head of the judiciary, uh, Sayyid Raisi, he was the head of the Razavi Foundation, which is the harem of uh, Imam Rada. So indeed a great servant of Imam Rada alayhi salam, and he got a day whereby, as much as people are celebrating the day of the Bilad of Imam Rada alayhi salam, he has gone back to his Lord on the same day, or around the same days. So condolences to Imam Rada alayhi salam, to the 12th Holy Imam, to the Iranian nation, and all of us, uh, it's a big loss. He was not only a president, he was not only a normal scholar, but he was a faqih. And we are told that death of an alim is death of an alam. So indeed a big loss to the Shia community, it's not only to the Iranian nation. So before we go ahead on Surah Fatiha for Sayyid Raisi and the foreign minister and all those who passed away in this tragic accident, inshallah. Salva ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So the topic uh, for today is no shortcuts to the top. I know the topic, the notice that went out initially, the name was slightly different, but I changed it. I thought it, this would be more appropriate for today. It's uh, a title that I've taken from one of the best books that I have read. It's called No Shortcuts to the top, climbing the 14 highest peaks in the world by Ed Vistas and David Roberts. So Ed Vistas and David Roberts both are mountaineers. And something unique about them, they're not normal mountaineers, but they have climbed the top 14 peaks in the world, which is no small feat. They are all above 8,000 meters. So Kilimanjaro is 5,000 meters, roughly 5,500 if I'm not mistaken. But 8,000 is really high, 28, 29,000 feet, 26,000 feet. And usually people climb it with oxygen. This man has done all these peaks without any supplement, oxygen supplement. So he climbed it without additional oxygen, which is indeed a great feat. And he was a climber for almost 18 years in which he got to attempt all these peaks. He started with Everest and then all the others. And he finished off with Annapurna Base Camp, which is Annapurna Mountain, which is in one of these 14 uh, peaks. But what inspired him was he said in his high school days, he opened up, there was a book that he came across Incidentally, so the whole book was about Annapurna when he read it, that is what inspired him to become a climber. And that's where the journey started. So one small lesson here, the habit of reading. For those of you who read or heard Ayatollah Khamenei in the recent book festival in Tehran, he said there's no excuse. Everybody should be reading books. This is a habit that is 
quickly leaving our young ones, even elders. Very rarely do people read. And reading puts those seeds on which children can, can grow and plant them and mature, inshallah, in those ideas. So that was lesson number one. But talking more about Edvistus, this particular climber, he didn't take any unnecessary risks. So his principle was that going up the mountain is not mandatory, it's optional. But coming down is mandatory. So every mountain that you climb, it's optional to reach the peak. But coming down is a must, you can't live on the mountain. So he never took unnecessary risks. There are times when he was within 300 feet of the peak and he abandoned that expedition. There was a time when he was 50 meters away from the peak, just 100 yards away, and he abandoned. He said, I'm not going to the peak because it's risky. So a very calculated move, and mind you, this is not a day's trip. So when they start planning, when they start climbing, it's almost 10 weeks on the mountain. So sometimes two months on the mountain. They started their expedition, you're very close to the peak and he would abandon. He said, this is too risky, I will be back here. The last peak, of course, was Annapurna. And this is just to show the risk, the risk factor that was, the risk that he was taking. So Annapurna base camp, when he climbed, only 160 people had made it to the peak. And half of them had died. So the success rate was 50%. Out of every two people who climb Annapurna, one person dies. Yet he attempted and he was successful. After trying for two, three times, third attempt, he was successful. So very interesting, he said, they asked him, why didn't you want to do it with oxygen? Why didn't you wear a mask? So he says, I did want to bring the mountain down to my level, but I wanted to climb the mountain on its own terms. Why should I wear an oxygen mask, be restrict myself. I wanted to put my nose into the mountain and I did not want to bring the mountain down to my level. I wanted to climb the mountain on its own terms. And he would listen to the mountain. He said, always listen to the mountain. Now, this is his own way of describing the mountain. Because the mountain is always talking to you. But this is a Quranic message also. Yusabbihu lillahi ma fis samawat wa ma fil ard. We are told everything in the earth praises Allah. There's another verse which says, okay, we are going to give this trust to the earth or to the skies and to the mountains. But they refused and then it was given to Insan. Insan took it. So it looks like as much as it's just standing there, but it's, it's a very living creature, the mountain. Other places we are told that if this Quran was revealed on the mountains, the mountains would crumble that shows that the mountains have that capacity to absorb spirituality. That of the Quran would have been too much for the mountain. So people who have climbed, they would get to communicate with the mountain, being with, with nature. Alhamdulillah, I also have been blessed with this hobby. Um, so I have a story of my own to tell also. 1989, I was just 10 years old, if I'm not mistaken, or 1987, 1987. I was only 10 years old, and there was a group in Arusha, I think it was a scouts group, or friends group, and they were going up. And my late father was brave enough to let me go with them. I was training with them, and he said, then, John said, ja. So at the age of 10, we went up Meru. Alhamdulillah, I made it to the peak. But what happened was I had severe altitude sickness and I had cerebral edema. So there was water accumulation in the brain. And I started hallucinating. The guides did not realize it. So I started seeing visions when I reached the peak. So the toll was, was big. Alhamdulillah, made it safe. I'm standing here in front of you. 1989, I got a chance of climbing Meru again. That time it was easier. Now that you've done it the first time, the second time is easier. Grade 7, it was compulsory to climb. And not compulsory, but they had an expedition and most of the grade 7 leavers would go up the mountain. And then 92, 
1992 Kilimanjaro, and I've climbed Kilimanjaro again twice after that. Recently, December, I got to go to Meru again after so many years, and this time I went with my sons, my three sons, and coincidentally, my youngest son was 10 years old. So exactly the same age that I had climbed, my youngest son was also 10. And just the way altitude hit me, it hit him also. So it was not cerebral edema, it was not very serious, but a lot of vomiting. So I could see that mirror image as to how I was at that time. And it's a common response to the mountains. Whenever you're up there, people would always shout, you always hear it, I'm not coming to this place again. Everybody would tell you, I'm not coming to this place again. What is this? Yet, two, three months later, I hear my sons now, oh, that was a trip. When are we going again? It's very similar to Hajj. Hajj season is coming. When people are in Hajj, Arafat, Mina, Musdalifa, you hear people shouting. This place, I know it's wajib, wajibat is done. We are not coming here again. Yet, the coming year when Hajj time comes, and you see them wanting to go for Hajj again. So a lot of similarities between mountaineering and, and, and Hajj. So a few lessons uh, to be learned from the ulama, from mountaineering. We are very blessed to be close to these peaks. The highest peak in Africa, we have Meru and so many other peaks. But being one with nature, going out of the city, so Agapanahian has talked about it. He says, being with nature is, should be a common behavior of all the mu'mineen. The mu'mineen should be craving to go out to nature. They would not be happy sitting in this concrete jungle. They would be wanting to be one with nature. Why? Because they benefit from it spiritually. As we said, يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ that in a constant state of dhikr, nature is in a constant state of dhikr. It is humans who forget. So when you're there, you can experience the spirituality of, of nature. And Agapanahian has a very good observation. He says, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad Muhammad. He said he used to live in Makkah, and he knew the value of the Kaaba. And he knew the value of worshipping next to the Kaaba. Although it was filled with idols, but the Prophet knew the value of the Holy Kaaba. Yet, he would regularly leave the Kaaba and go to the mountains to worship. And he quotes the 10th Holy Imam saying that he went almost daily to the mountains. It was, it was a regular practice that he wanted to go and worship in, in nature. In fact, Agapanahian says okay, his character, the Prophet's character, he was full of mercy. He was known to be a person full of mercy. He says this molding of the character was done by the environment. He constantly spent time in a place which was full of mercy. When you see nature, the mountains, the rivers, it's just sitting there peaceful, full of mercy, and that was the character of the Holy Prophet. So this molding of the character of the Prophet was because of the time that he spent with nature. Coincidentally, we are in the month of Dhul Qad, just now, and we are told that this is the time when Nabi Musa was also invited by Allah to go meet him. So Surah Araf, verse number 142, A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Ar-Rajim, Wa wa'adna Musa thalatheena layla, so the Thalatina Layla, he was invited, and then 10 days were added. So we are told this 30 days were the month of Dhul Qad. And 10 days that were added were the first 9 days or 10 days of the month of Dhul Hijjah. So sacred days that we are going through, the, the, the Urafa, the Ulama, make use of these days. Just like the holy month of Ramadan, some of them fast, they have some spiritual exercises. But when he was invited, he was not invited to the city. He was invited to the mountains again. That come to me, but come to the mountains. So the Sinai mountains. 
Mount Sinai. So Abu Panahian says, you just don't talk about the harm, harms of social media. Just now, many scholars, many speakers speak about mobile phones and internet. And he says, don't just criticize social media and screens, but always give boys or girls or youngsters an option. Instead of mobile phones, give them an option. Let them experience nature. Once they experience nature, they would not want to see nature behind the screens. They would not want to see nature on the screens, but they, want to, they would want to experience it directly. So expose your youths to, to nature. So this is lesson number one, being with, with nature through mountaineering. Secondly, there's a verse in the Holy Quran, very interesting. Chapter 6, verse number 125 says, Yashrah sadrahu lil Islam. Whoever Allah desires to guide, guidance is from Allah. When Allah wants to guide somebody, what does He do? He opens His breast to Islam. Rabbi Shrah li sadri. So here it says, Yashrah sadrahu lil Islam. Wa man yurid an yudillahu. When Allah desires to lead somebody astray, when, take, when He wants to take guidance away from somebody, يَجْعَلْ صَدْرَهُ ضَيِّكًا حَرَجًا كَأَنَّمَا يَسَّعَدُ فِي السَّمَا So when he wants to mislead somebody, he makes his breast narrow and straightened as if he was climbing a height. He's talking about altitude sickness. For those of you who have experienced, I've experienced it, altitude sickness. Whenever we go up the mountain, altitude sickness. I had hallucinations, difficulty in breathing, when we went up Kilimanjaro, I couldn't take five steps. Five steps. One, two, three, four, five, you're tired. You have to hold, take your breath again, hold, stand there for a while. Breathlessness, lack of oxygen. You can't think clearly. It's cold up there because you're at a very high altitude. So Allah says when He wants to misguide somebody, He narrows down His chest as if He's going up an altitude, like altitude sickness. This is spiritually. كَذَلِكَ يَجْعَلُ اللَّهُ الرِّجْسَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Thus does Allah lay spiritual defilement on those who do not have faith. And we experience this. There are some, when the holy month of Ramadan comes, they start getting tightness on the chest. Not physically. I was talking to a person who came back from Hajj. I think he had gone for Ziyarah, I think. There's Umrah and Ziyarah. So he did Umrah and he went for Ziyar of the 14 Masumin and came back. And when he was asked, how was the experience? He said it was a spiritual overdose. This was his answer. This was a spiritual overdose. It was too much. There are people when the holy month of Ramadan comes, when you ask them to worship, I'm one of them. You know? It becomes too much. Aklubadu kara, hajar rakat, mainana. This many tasbihs, this much of Quran, this much of... And it's like altitude sickness, we can't take it. And then you start counting days, you know? Okay, when is Eid? So that we come out of this. So altitude sickness, tightness of the chest, spiritual chest, when we can't take in spirituality. Even when scholars come in, sometimes we always want the scholars to bring their level down. He must be a top scholar. They come in with their level of knowledge. But yet, we don't want to raise ourselves. This was raised by a scholar recently. That why do we always expect the scholar to come down and explain things to us? Why can't we raise ourselves spiritually, as far as knowledge is concerned? We get altitude sickness amongst the scholars. When they are on the member, and we feel we can't cope up. We get this altitude sickness. So this is something we need to think about. We need to raise ourselves. How do we do that? Add Vistas again. Add Vistas, this climber. So he started his career. He was living in Illinois. Then he moved to Seattle. Because there were no mountains in Illinois. So he moved to Seattle. Seattle had a lot of mountains. There's Mount Rainier there. 
and that's where he started training. You know how many times he's climbed this Mount, Mount Rainier? Is your training? 208 times. And it's not a small mountain, it's as high as Mount Meru. I think it's 14,000 feet plus. 208 times. Recently, when we were in Arusha, when we went to climb Mount Meru, you have to go up with a ranger because there are wild animals around. So the ranger who was walking ahead of us, he is the one who takes care of your pace. We are all supposed to walk behind him. An old man holding a rifle in his hand and he's walking slowly. And my son got mesmerized by the way he was walking. Steady pace he was walking. And we asked him, how many times have you done Meru? He says, 50 times. Five zero. There was a chef that you talked to 50 times. So these small, small peaks that you climb regularly, and even Ed Vistas talks about it. He says, when we had to go to these big peaks, sometimes we would go and stay there for some time. Or if you've done one peak, it would be easier to do the other peak. So acclimatization. When you go to Kilimanjaro, they give you one day of rest on the mountain so that your lungs and your body acclimatizes to high altitude. So similarly, with spirituality, small, small things that we have to do, be it salah, be it fasting on a weekly basis, or fasting on the first days, nine days of Dil Hijjah, or the three days that we have to fast, maybe in Rajab or Shaaban, or we are told the first Thursday, the middle Wednesday, and the last Thursday, we should not take them lightly. These are the ones that prepare us for this altitude sickness. So even reciting Quran, the little Quran that we recite prepares us to take in more of the Quran. So spiritually, there is acclimatization which enables us to go to higher levels. Even knowledge, the little knowledge that we take, if we take it seriously, it enables us to go to higher heights. So we don't get this altitude sickness when the time comes. So that is number two. But the main reason why I talked about mountains today. You know, going to the mountain is difficult. Once I was going up Kilimanjaro, and when I went to Moshi before the climb, I went to meet a colleague of mine, a doctor, and I told him, I'm going up Kilimanjaro, why don't you join me? So he tells me, I mountain fine luggage. I am not jarur. Nothing. Kilimanjaro looks very nice from Moshi town. We don't have to go up there. There's another friend, I told him, okay, let's go up the mountain. He says, how much do you pay? Okay, we pay some amount, minimum 900 million shillings these days. It's quite expensive. Those days, it was a bit cheaper. So you pay a lot of money. So I told him, okay, this is the amount that you pay. He said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Why can't we use this money and go to a five-star hotel or a four-star hotel and relax by the beach? This is madness. You spend so much money to go up there and struggle. Toilet issue, sleeping issues. You can't sleep at high altitude. It's cold, sleeping, sleeping bags, wearing a lot of clothes, hard beds sometimes. And the climbing itself, when you make the final ascent to the peak, it's at night. They take you up at night, midnight plus the frostbite because it's cold. So the frostbite. So you're paying money to put yourself through difficulty. So he says, Fari gai It doesn't make sense to him. So Ayatollah Khamenei, may Allah give him a long life. He's written a small discourse, a small paper or a small booklet about patience, about sabr. And I got this very recently, but it was published long back. It was translated during the Bosnia crisis. It was translated into English then, but I got, got hold of it recently. So he says, and I quote him, he says, an indifferent, unaware believer, so believer who is indifferent, who is unaware, jahiliya, could be compared to a soldier in the battlefield who is fighting naked without wearing any armor. So you're going to war, and there's war all the time. Kullu yawmin ashura, kullu ardin karbala. 
We are at war every single day. Ayatollah Khamenei says, but a person who goes there who is not equipped, it is like a soldier going on the battlefield without a bulletproof suit or without armor. Such an ill-equipped soldier is most likely to be killed or he'll disappear from the scene during the very first encounter. Either he'll run away from the battlefield or he'll get killed. But an unaware, but an aware conscientious, knowledgeable Muslim with Islamic ideology, one whose aqaid is very strong, could be compared to a soldier who is fully clad in armor from head to foot. He's well protected and is fully equipped with all the required armaments. Obviously, for the enemy to defeat such a well-equipped soldier is a relatively difficult task. The enemies will not be able to defeat him. So it's very important for us to equip ourselves with knowledge, but more importantly, with sabr. So then he defines patience. This is the definition of patience in this book. He says, on the basis of traditions, on hadith and the Quran, patience is defined as the resistance shown by men on the road towards perfection against mischief, corruption, and degradation, which can be compared to the example of a mountaineer. Atullah Khamenei uses the example of a mountaineer, who in order to reach the peak has to face internal as well as external obstacles or barriers. So all this time we thought, or I thought, patience is when somebody is doing something to you, just bear it quietly. Sahan Karilio. The definition is different. In this journey of perfection, you head out, you leave your comfort zone. If you have to pay money, you pay your money. You go out into the wilderness or on the battlefield, spiritual battlefield. And you are well equipped and whatever you can tolerate on the battlefield, that is called sabr. So altitude sickness, the factors within yourself when you're climbing a mountain or the factors outside, be it the cold or the wild animals. So he talks about them. So someone who is faced with these kinds of barriers will have the option to either drop his journey, the many who go up there and say, no, we can't do this, we are going back, which is full of dangers and hardships, or to go ahead by offering resistance against them and overcoming each barrier with his power of determination. The second case is defined as patience. So there's one who will always run away from a challenge. And there's another one who will take the challenge head on and face it day to day, day to day, small steps at a time. That is what is called patience. Atullah Khamenei defines patience and he compares it to mountaineering. That was the main reason why I took this up. And because it's the eighth Imam's Wilada day. So the hadith from our eighth holy Imam he says, stand for the truth and be patient, even if it is bitter and inconvenient. So in the journey of the truth, in journey of perfection, even if it's inconvenient, it's bitter, bear it. And then to finish, I will, so running short of, of time. So just one more hadith of the eighth holy imam, which will be a tabaruk for this day. I've mentioned this hadith here, if I'm not mistaken. If not, it was a reminder for me. So inshallah, it'll be a reminder for all of us. And if you see these 10 things, he says, the intellect of a Muslim is not complete until he or she has 10 qualities. So when it comes to sabr, it is a battle of the intellect. There are powers, we have the power of imagination, we have the power of desire, we have the power of anger. And to control these, we need the power of intellect. All of these should be under the power of the intellect. And that is sabr. So he says, your capacity to do sabr, your capacity to complete your intellect will not be possible until you have these 10 habits. Number one, people only expect goodness and benefaction from you. So if your intellect is complete, people will only expect goodness from you. It's a very difficult task, making everybody 
not making everybody happy. But when people look at you, you can ask, raising your character to such a level that people feel safe from you. The Holy Prophet was an example. Number two, people can expect to be secure from any wrongdoing and harm from this person. So the first one was they expect nothing but good. Akar se to saruj kar se. Number two, they never expect you to do any harm to them. If you can raise your level to this, that shows that your intellect is complete. Number three, they consider a small amount of benefaction from others to be abundant and plentiful. They will always consider it to be big. They'll always consider it to be big. Number four, they consider their own benevolence and goodness to others to be insufficient. When they do something good for others, they will always consider it to be small. When others do favors on them, however small it may be, he'll always consider it to be big. When he does favors on others, however big it may be, he'll always consider it to be small. It's a sign of a mature intellect. Number five, they do not get tired of the demands and requirements that they are asked to fulfill. Ek manas keklu kare. You always use this phrase. Ek manas keklu kare. But here, Imam Brada says, if you want to see how mature your intellect is, you say, they never get tired of demands and requirements that they are asked to fulfill. Their capacity is very big. They don't suffer from altitude sickness. They're always willing to go higher and higher. Number six, they, sp they spend the entirety of their lives seeking knowledge. The elderly ladies here, hats off to you. At this age, you're still coming to the Hausa to seek knowledge. Deshak, it's a lesson for us youngsters. They don't get tired of seeking knowledge till the last day of their lives. Number seven, Humble poverty is more beloved to them than wealth and affluence. Not that there's something wrong with wealth and affluence, but they prefer poverty, humble poverty, to be better than wealth. Number eight, humility while striving on the path of God is more beloved to them than being exalted while pleasing his enemy. When they have a choice of being exalted in front of the enemy, and being humble in serving Allah, they'll always choose being humble in front of Allah rather than being exalted in front of the enemy. The Gulf countries just now, they have a choice. You serve the Palestinians and work for them. This is being humble in the eyes of Allah. But they want to be exalted in the eyes of the enemy. So leave them aside. This is the principle that they are following. Number nine, anonymity is more beloved to them than fame. They don't like fame. They always love to be humble and maybe unappreciated also, not a problem. They are happy with whatever they have been given. And lastly, they do not encounter any person. So this is the main one. The tenth one, he says, what will you know about the tenth one? Then the tenth one, he says, they do not encounter another person except that they say he or she is better and more pious than myself. They say he is more pious than I am. Usually, Suthai, when we have reached a status, when we look at other people, to bekar chya jahannam bhi chya manso. Enu iman barabar na thi, kachu chya enu iman. Hum kai bhaino chho. The tenth, eighth holy imam says, when they see others, they always consider others to be better than themselves. If you look at these ten things, it's all about patience. It's not easy to bring these qualities within ourselves. It's a challenge. But if we take this challenge, and try to be the way the Eighth Holy Imam wants us to be, it builds up our patience for a day when we'll have to use it, what the Palestinians are going through just now. It's not an easy test, but they had prepared for it. 
there were things that they had done, it has taken us, their sabr to another level. Now the difficulty is coming upon them. There are things that we cannot bear. But yet you see them standing, the warriors, the civilians. Maybe it was these ten things. It has built their sabr to such a level that they can bear whatever they're going through. So may Allah give us the tawfiq, inshallah, on this auspicious day to act on this hadith of the eighth holy imam and to act on these advices of Ayatollah Khamenei. He should build up our sabr, he should give us the tawfiq to practice sabr, inshallah, and of course to spend time with nature. Try to be one with nature. He should give us that extra time which is also risk to go and spend time with nature so that we can also benefit from nature, inshallah. Thank you for listening attentively. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa